So hi everyone, I'm Lucy from General Assembly and welcome to today's webinar, Who Runs the World Female Founders. Thanks for joining us and a big thank you to Blue Chili and She Starts for collaborating with us on this event. Before we commence, General Assembly Australia would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians and traditional custodians of the land where we live, learn and work and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, hi everyone, I'm Hilary Brainerd and I'm head of marketing at Blue Chili. At Blue Chili, our mission is to solve society's greatest problems with technology. We run startup accelerators, executive education courses, innovation workshops, lean validators, and hackathons. Um, she Starts is a Blue Chili run accelerator program for women-led tech startups in Australia. And all three of our panelists today are alumni of that program. We're actually currently looking for sponsors for our next She Starts program. So if your company or you are interested, please send us an email at hello at shestarts.com. Um, tonight, we're gonna talk about founding, funding, and failures and how to come back from them. Um, we'll start with Anna, who's next to me right now. And when you're done, you can just nominate who's gonna go next. Yeah, hi, thanks, Hilary. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, so my name's Anna Wright. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of an app called Bindi Maps. Uh, so Bindi Maps is a smartphone app that helps anyone find their way around a complicated uh, building. So inside of something like a hospital, a shopping center or a university. And uh, nowadays anyone can use the app, but when I started back in She Starts Days, uh, we designed the app uh, for people who are blind or vision impaired, because once they're inside of one of those big, large, complicated buildings, it's fairly much impossible for them to find their way around. And I would challenge every sighted uh, participant here today that the next time you do see a braille sign in a public building on a, on a bathroom or something similar, um, ask yourself if you were blind, how would you know that that sign was even there? So that's Bindi Maps. Thanks, Hilary. And I will nominate Lucinda to go next um, because she was part of the same cohort as me. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. It's always wonderful to see you again and also to Danielle. Thanks very much for having us here, Hilary. Uh, so my name is Lucinda. I'm a co-founder of Neighbolytics. And Neighbolytics was, as Anna said, one of the part of the inaugural She Starts cohort. Um, we're a social analytics platform that measures urban life. That's the everyday activity that goes on within and between buildings in a neighbourhood. And my background is as an urban designer. I spent my career designing cities. And as you know, the best places, the best neighbourhoods are vibrant and dynamic and full of life and activity. But one of the challenges is the data that we use to understand cities tends to only relate to our physical environment, like the building height or how fast the traffic is going and not all of the other business and community life that's so critical to our well-being. So Neighbolytics harnesses a whole range of digital data about the ways that we interact with our built environment every day uh, to create real-time maps of neighbourhoods and how they work from an urban life perspective. So I'll pass to Danielle, I guess. <laughs> Lucinda. Hi guys, um, I'm Danielle. Uh, I'm the founder of Pioneera. Firstly, my apologies because my laptop died. It's not charging just before this. So I was madly trying to grab another laptop. Thank goodness um, I had here. So my apologies for the delay. Um, I'm the founder of Pioneera and we've built the Grammarly for mental health. So I followed these two fabulous women. I was in She Starts too. Um, and what we do is we use language to help see the early warning signs of stress and wellness and burnout, particularly in workplaces. Um, and we help people understand that. We help teams and managers understand that. And we give them some tips to prevent burnout before it happens. Um, thank you, guys. Um, I guess, like, just sort of riffing off that, like, how did you each come up with your the idea for your startup? And how have you adapted to the different stages of your business, like being a scrappy startup to where you are now? And what if it's like a bunch of questions in one? Sorry, but um, what have you had to learn or unlearn along the way? Lucinda, she's smiling. Yeah, if, I, if I'm honest, Neighbolytics started very much by accident. Um, so the, the, the problem is a problem that my co-founder Jessica and I have been exploring for the past decade is, you know, how do you measure urban life? And that came from very practical experiences. We were working actually in another business that we, we founded together 
uh, which was a consultancy, very different business, to try to make our cities more active. And so we were working on a lot of the projects that we see every day around us right now because of COVID, like outdoor dining and pop-up spaces and parklets. But what we noticed was a lot of the benefit of these projects wasn't actually the physical infrastructure, which is actually mostly just AstroTurf and milk crates. The real value that was created was that people were coming together and making new friendships and helping local businesses. And none of that value was being quantified or, or created or even really understood in order to make better investment and planning decisions. And so we had been trying to solve that by standing on street corners and observing people, by using time-lapse photography and, and trying to understand places. And it really wasn't until um, we saw She Starts advertised, and at the time I was living in the Pacific and Samoa on maternity leave, sitting on a beach and thought, well, I wonder if there is a more technical solution to this problem that we're solving and somewhat on a whim put in an application and then was actually incredibly surprised to have been selected because our idea was incredibly early stage. We knew we were experts in the problem. We knew this was a big global problem to be solved, but actually had very little idea about how we would use technology to harness that. So um, that was our very early stage beginning. And um, you know, I'm sure throughout the session tonight, we'll talk more about how we've grown since then. Um, Danielle, do you wanna go next? Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm an ex corporate gal, I guess is probably the best way to put it. So I used to run retail networks and call centers and large scale transformation for big companies and loved it. I did it for 20 years, I'm showing my age now, um, absolutely loved everything that I did, but burnt out in 2016. And I didn't see the warning signs. So, um, you know, we're all super busy and we're running really hard. And so I just fronted up to my boss's office. And this is my third boss in like nine months. And I opened opened my mouth to tell him an update of something I was working on and what came out of my mouth was I'm done he's like what are you resigning I'm like yes I think I am so I had a bit of time out and I looked back on that time and realized I had seen in my team's emails here we go again I don't want to do this anymore and I'm like wow what if we could just automate someone stepping in and helping them at that point and so that's how Pioneer came about. Um, I didn't, I don't, I'm not a technology expert, so I'm a business person. So um, part of going into She Starts, a bit like what Lucinda was saying, was I had this idea and I came across Nicola Hazel, who was sort of built She Starts, and, and I talked to her about what I wanted to do. And she said, That's a startup. And I said, What's a startup? I had no idea what a startup even was. And so I went into She Starts and they kind of got me started. Um, I think, you know, you asked about being a scrappy startup to where we've built. I still feel like we're a scrappy startup startup actually um, and in a good way because I still think we're trying to figure out how to deal with this big problem um, and using technology in an unusual way so that's that's kind of how we got to this point. Um, Anna you're up next. I think there's a bit of a theme going through here so the third non-technical startup founder <laughs> will talk um, and also the sort of scrappy idea that got <laughs> put towards uh, she starts and got funded um, so I have lived experience with vision impairment, which is um, part of the reason. So I, I understood the problem and I had a base idea of the, of the technology that we could use to make GPS work effectively indoors. Um, yeah, so that's sort of how Bindi Map started and has just grown enormously from there, which again, I'm, as Lucinda and Daniel said, I'm sure we're going to be talking about that um, a bit more later on. Yeah, I think you you guys all mentioned that you were a She Starts alumni. And um, what did you, why did you decide to apply for the She Starts program? And what was it like being part of an accelerator? Like, I think it's something a lot of people don't know much about. So it'd be interesting to hear like an insider view. Probably like Danielle. I mean, I, sometimes I just have to be honest that I didn't really know what a startup was. I mean, I had business experience. It's not my first company, but uh, very new to technology and um, my brother's a software developer and I deliberately didn't go into tech because that honestly looked so boring, really. <laughs> um, I was a designer, like why would I, I didn't actually see that, I actually didn't, I had a, I think a mental barrier that I now see is completely constructed, that I didn't think that I could be a technical founder, like, a, you know, a founder of a tech company because I wasn't from a computer science background, which is a total fallacy. I now see that actually the best tech founders are experts in the problem, not necessarily experts in the technology. Um, uh, but yeah, I think what attracted me, to, I, I probably wouldn't be here without She Starts. And I honestly say that because I, the, what attracted me was 
uh, it's felt like a safe space to explore questions about tech and startups, which at the time, you know, very naively didn't understand very much. And I, and I think looking back, it's, it's quite incredible because I feel like, you know, we now have a really solid team. We've done two funding rounds. We're really on a fast trajectory to scaling. And I've learned a lot about startups and, and how they work. But back then, uh, I had a lot of business experience, but was very new to technology. And she starts I think because it created that environment of being able to be honest and vulnerable and authentic with where our starting point was enabled us to get going. Uh, I, I um, feel the same way, Lucinda. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I experienced in the beginning was that because I wasn't a technical person, uh, people didn't take me necessarily very seriously and I didn't take myself seriously. So I had worked with technology, but I had worked with people that had worked with technology. So I kind of understood the building blocks, um, but I definitely didn't understand how it could work um, and how it could be experienced by people. So that was really interesting. And the um, accelerator, like the incubator, like Blue Chili actually helped me find the right people to help me answer some of those questions or at least get me on the right path. I think when you're starting to build something uh, new from scratch, particularly if you're building an idea that doesn't yet exist, you're having to spend a lot of time educating um, and engaging and understanding and being surrounded by a group of like-minded people really helps you do that not, not only do they connect you to a network but they actually give you some good resilience and support because I don't know about you guys but sometimes it's just really hard you go out and talk to someone and they just look at you like you've got three heads and you know this and I've been told by many uh people oh this won't work oh that's just not gonna work like just dismiss it but I'm like oh I actually think it is going to work. So um, it gives you the support and resilience to be able to keep going forward, but also some really practical things. Um, and you need that when you're starting out. So there's no need to go it alone if you've got the right support there. And I think that can just help you accelerate faster than you would be able to do on your own. Yeah, I, I agree with what everybody said. Um, my application went in at four o'clock in the morning um, after a lot of thinking, oh, what's the point in even doing it? Because I've only got it as an idea and no one's possibly going to be interested in, um, in, in my idea for helping people who are blind or vision impaired. I get around. Um, but yes, the, um, we got accepted in. And as Daniel said, so don't, both Danny and Elle and I were solo founders and Lucinda had a, had a co-founder. Um, but when you're on your very, very own, um, it can be a little bit daunting. But I think I was quite glad that I had no idea what uh, startup <laughs> life was really like, because I probably wouldn't have done it, um, especially not in the early days, where again, everyone was telling me that I was crazy and why would you give up a good job and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's done now. Yeah, I think there's definitely, I, I think that sometimes too, Anna, I think, wow, if someone had tried to tell me this is what it was going to be like, I'd be like, really? What, should I do that? Or should I just stay in my nice, cushy, you know, safe, easy job? Or, <laughs> but then again, that's, you know, I couldn't change the world otherwise. So that's the, that's the reason why we do it half the time. Yeah. Yeah, I love what you were saying, Lucinda, about it being a safe space. And I think like something you guys all sort of have in common was that technical barrier and like maybe a little bit of fear of like the unknown. So it's cool that it offered you the space to like explore that. Um, so we'll talk about accomplishments next. Like, what was your proudest accomplishment to date? Uh, I can jump in. I've got one that I talk about a lot. Um, and it was one of my very first um, user testing sessions. So we had out of out of the money from Blue Chili and the She Starts program, we had, um, which we'll be quite honest about, a fairly nasty proof of concept um, that lived on my phone. And I had given it to a friend of mine who is completely blind and a guide dog user. And I had, I was working at uh, University of Technology Sydney at the time, and they very kindly gave me about three floors of one of their very complicated buildings um, as a pilot site. So we could really run it through and see if it would work. So this very nasty proof of concept. And I asked Nick uh, to go and find the coffee shop, which she did. She had to go you know, up escalators downstairs all over the place. 
and got to the counter and was able to order herself and me a cup of coffee and came and sat down and she promptly burst into tears and I was like oh my god I'm so sorry I'm so sorry it's really rough like she's like no 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 you don't understand this is the very first time in my life that I've been able to do this on my own so it was just amazing and yeah that that's what picks you up when you know with Danielle and I were saying about this sort of awful startup life and then you get something like that and you realize that yeah if if, if I'm not doing it um it, it, who is going to do it and it has to be done oh, Anna that is a wonderful story it actually gave me chills when you said she started crying that's amazing um who wants to go next Danielle yeah, look, I think that's amazing. I think that's amazing. Um, and uh, so I've, I've got a couple, um, uh, you know, one customer who said that we'd help them prevent burning out with a big, huge, big smile on their face. So that was great. But I think the um, probably the one that we've celebrated the most is that um, Fast Company this year um, mentioned us or we were honourable mention as one of their world changing ideas. Um, and so that was pretty huge for us because, as I said, we've gotten quite a bit of feedback to say, oh, this just isn't going to work. Like, why would people want this? Why would people do this? Um, and so to have that sort of um, recognition, I guess, was pretty important for us, but pretty important for the team because, you know, I've got a small team. They work really hard. They're really committed. committed. They're really passionate. I want to say committed and passionate at the same time. Um, and so to have an external body like that validate the work that they're doing to help customers, to help companies was really powerful. So I think that's been an exciting moment for us. Yeah, thanks. I always find it's very difficult to sort of nominate um, one moment. And I think maybe we've been running long enough now that there's great statistics that we're working in 12 countries and we've just clocked over 2000 neighborhoods and there's things that I, I love um, about Neighbourlytics. But I think, yes, the, the Certainly um, when clients love our project, it's something that is um, very validating and keeps you on track. Um, but I thought I might share a story recently from our team. Um, and like everyone, you know, 2020 was a pretty dramatic year. And I think put everyone through the ringer with how they worked, where they worked, what they're working on, um, security and everything else. And um, we did a big team review in February um, just a level set where we were at and where we were going. And um, what I was most surprised by expecting to just be like heavily criticized from 2020 and everything we'd been everything through was the staff feedback that we received, um, particularly from our female engineers who said they'd never felt respected at work in the way that they had at Neighbourlytics, from our junior developers who said that they felt like they had voice and influence in a way that they never expected to have at work, um, and just that uh, our team really felt that this was a great place to work. And that was just incredibly reassuring, um, knowing the kind of year that we'd had and how difficult it was to support people through the challenge of working completely remotely and lockdowns and everything else that they felt not only happy with their job, but they felt in many ways um, that it gave them opportunities to have voice and influence in a way that they hadn't experienced in other workplaces. And I'm really proud to be creating the kind of business that we want to work in and creating the kind of pathways, particularly for women in tech that, um, that we want to be available. Now, Lucinda, how do you create a culture that, that gives people that sort of feeling? Like, is there anything in particular that you do to support your staff? Yeah, I mean, I often think about that because in some ways it's a lot of intuition rather than necessarily following um, a formula. But uh, I mean, partly we have worked with, you know, um, other coaches and mentors have given us really great advice on, on setting up company and systems. But a lot of it, I think, just comes down to paying attention and to being in an environment of curiosity. Um, we've recently, for the first time, sort of established company values and, and one of them is curiosity. And I think one thing I love is that I work with people who are genuinely smarter than me every day and I get to learn from them. And I think that kind of posture creates a lot of trust um, and we encourage others to be curious. Um, so there's sort of a culture of no blame, no, you know, we're all gonna fail. So let's just have no blame, let's look at it objectively, let's be curious about the problem. Uh, and that's really helped. Um, and then we've also just tried to be a startup that values having parents rooms more than ping pong tables and who, who values people 
bringing their whole selves to work and um, isn't trying to be, I don't know. I just find this just, who wants a ping pong table in their office anyway, by the way, that would be super annoying. Um, so just to sort of try and be less bro culture and more just like real human, I think. So um, it's just those sort of small, small things about encouraging people to be real and yeah, bring the kids to work, bring your pets to work um, when you're allowed to be in the office or put them on Zoom, whatever it is, um, and to have that kind of culture around. Yeah, I love the culture of, of um, curiosity. Like I think a lot of workplaces I've been at in the past, like it was a bit of like, it was a bit embarrassing to ask a, like a stupid question. So it's nice to know like that you can ask whatever you want and like not feel fear of that. Um, so uh, Lucinda and Anna, you've both raised capital and Danielle, you're, re you're considering raising now. Um, Lucinda and Anna, do you wanna share what that process was like and what the biggest hurdles were and how you eventually did get funding? Shall I go first, <laughs> Lucinda, and say it's horrible? <laughs> it's a, um, a fairly crazy journey. Um, I'd say the biggest hurdle or the, the, the biggest practical hurdle is to get your lead investor. Um, and once once you've got that, then you can get, let, get all your ducks in a line, so to speak. Uh, but it can be really hard and it takes a lot of research and a lot of no's and a lot of talking to different people to work out who that lead uh, will be or, or, or could be. Yeah, I would second what Anna said. Uh, I, I remember uh, someone from Blue Chile, I think Nicola actually said, when you're raising capital, you're probably gonna need to have a hundred coffees. I'm like, not really, surely. <laughs> I mean, we've got a pretty good business here. <laughs> yeah, definitely a hundred meetings. Um, if not more. And yeah, I mean, I think in some ways it's a very, um, it's a great process because you're really needing to back yourself and, and decide on a lot of strategic directions and kind of put a line in the sand around what you think your valuation is and defending that and putting all of those things together. But at the same time, because it tends to be quite an intense period, pitching two, three times a day for weeks, and having a lot of no's and a lot of feedback is actually, it's it's hard to have a lot of resilience in that time because you're really just like in that defense mode and being on so hard um, for a long extended period of time. Um, but in the end, I suppose for Nabolytics, our approach was to build relationships with networks um, and investors really early. Like we were constantly and still are to be fair, um, constantly meeting with investors when they come across our path, even when we're not raising, um, understanding their process, asking them what it would look like to be raised ready from their perspective, understanding their criteria, staying in touch. And then when we did decide to raise, we opened around for a um, short period of time, which is another advice to us. So we said we're only open for three weeks, which is why we we're having three or four pitches a day. Um, now, obviously, the round actually took three or four months to close, but having that really intensive period um, did force a lot of fast no's, which I think is the next best thing after a yes. Uh, so we kind of worked out who was interested and who was not and was able to secure a lead investor at the end of that first three weeks, which meant the others were much easier to come on board. Um, but when I think about it, the kinds of investors that we have are mostly women. <laughs> um, it's more patient capital. We elected to work with family trusts rather than VC funds in the seed round, although we're looking for VC funding in our series A, so a different sort of mix there. Um, but I think personally, it's a very grueling process to go through because you have to take all of the feedback all at once. And it's an opportunity cost for your business, as I'm sure you've heard. You, it's really a full-time job for a few months um, raising money. So good luck. <laughs> Yeah, I love that question. Like, what what does it take to be investment ready? Like, I think that's a that's really good advice for founders that are looking for capital now, and just understanding like what their future investors want out of them. And so, Danielle, you've bootstrapped your business from the beginning, and you're considering raising capital now. Why did you choose to bootstrap, and what's your plan for the future? Um. I think uh, it's a couple of reasons that a choice and then sometimes it's just circumstance. So we we started to try and do a raise um, beginning of last year and then COVID hit and it just became, you know, the angels that we had um, on board. Because I think you need to think about what sort of funding you need at what sort of time. So Lucinda also, you know, already mentioned that for their seed round, they looked at family offices and stuff like that. So we were doing the same. We were looking at angel investors for the seed round because you just don't have enough kind of regular 
repeatable business for the VCs to be um, ready or interested. And I think that's important when you're starting to raise because you think in the beginning we went and talked to everyone um, and that probably wasted a lot of time because we know that we're not ready for VCs. At the seed round, you're not ready for VCs. So focus your effort on the angel investors, the syndicates, the, um, the high net worth individuals if you can find them because they're, they're wanting to back an early stage idea, an early stage founder or something. So that's one thing I would, I would think about. So we had our angels lined up and then COVID hit and literally they all just went, you know, I need to deploy my money to family or to whatever it is. So we put it on hold. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I um, had some money that I was able to lend the business. So I was able to bootstrap it through that period of time. Um, I feel like we're in a different position now. So we're starting to get some, you know, we relaunched the new platform specifically for small businesses and medium sized businesses early this year. And we're starting to get some good traction. So we're looking again to bring some capital in because what we want to be able to do now is get into the position um, like Anna and Lucinda are in where we can start, start to scale this a little bit, but still we're looking at angels and high net worth because we're not at that VC level just yet. So that's the conversations that we're having. Um, I, I haven't counted how many coffees I've had Lucinda, but I reckon I've had about 4,000 Zoom meetings. Um, it's like the, the new coffee. I just bring this now to everything that I do. Um, and, you know, that's an important vetting process, uh, I think, for the investor, but also an important vetting process for us. So my plan is that we were, we're trying to do the time limit, like Lucinda said, close it by the end of June. Um, and so we're having those conversations now, some of which are progressing well, some of which are progressing slowly, some of which are not progressing at all. So, um, but that's the that's the reason why we wanted to do it now is because we felt like we had product market fit and we felt like we we're in a position to start to scale. It's just about finding the right people. So fingers crossed. It does take a lot of time and effort though. I mean, you know, working these days, running a business already is a big time commitment. Um, I spend way more time sitting at my desk than, than, you know, I probably should. And then you've got to put that investment on top of it. So you want to move quite quickly. So it's not distracting you from, you know, your team or your customers or the product or anything like that. So if you can time box it, but yeah, it's a tough process and everyone says they dislike it. So surely at some point we can fix it. So it's not so hideous for everyone. So, you know, I, I don't have an answer to that, but that's my thinking. Yeah, I think um, the fast no is like a really good one too. Like, I think mm -hmm. sometimes the, the amount of time that you spend waiting and like worrying about the answer is like really painful. We'll switch to failures now because um, that's something that everyone has done. Like we've all failed. And um, the important thing is like, how do you come back from that? So what's your most surprising or interesting failure and how did you overcome it? Oh, so many. <laughs> Um, but I think probably a, a pertinent one, um, uh, well, yeah, perhaps there's a couple of different flavors of, of what failure looks like. But I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned is running a technology company is incredibly different from running a human services business, which is what I've done previously. And uh, the assumptions that I made around what tech could do and how fast it could move and is just very different. Uh, and so I think I've made the mistake in quite a spectacular way of um, promising programs to clients that we ultimately were not in a position to deliver. And uh, then had to, as a result of that, um, you know, string those customers out with like up to six, 12 month delays, um, which I honestly didn't foresee because I was like, well, we already had a prototype. I just thought if we had a prototype for one place, doing it in 15 places would be no big deal, uh, but it was. And so I think the lesson that we've learned from that is yes, while you want to get product market fit and know that someone will pay for it before, you know, you often want to sell it before you've built it. That's often the way is to have a lot more transparency and for myself to have a lot more education and awareness around where specifically we are at with our technology. And I, I know always in general terms, but to know very specifically and have a lot more collaboration internally, um, because I think that costs us a lot of, um, not just customer relationships, but it's probably more in terms of the opportunity cost of us to kind of deliver on things that weren't, we were delivering them for a deadline then rather than what was necessarily best for the tech stack. Uh, and so I think there's just a lot of, um, lessons around collaboration and learning there that have been really important to how we've moved forward with our product. Um, so yeah, that, that's one. And there's many hundreds more where that came from. <laughs>
at, at Bindi Maps, we don't like to call them mistakes or failures. So we're a little bit more like Lucinda and Neighbourlytics in that they're all learnings. So it's <laughs> what are some of the more painful learnings? Um, and I think I, I, I'll, you know, uh, I can agree with Lucinda. It's always hard in a startup when you're trying to sell um, to big, you know, to you your clients and you do have prototypes and you're not quite sure how well they're going to go um so yeah there's there's been a lot of learnings around that and pricing and staffing and and all of those things i think we all yeah we just move very fast and try and fix it quickly yeah yeah i agree with you guys i mean we say that the only failure is not trying so everything else you can kind of, you know, you should learn from. So, um, and we have many, many, many things that we learn from frequently, um, definitely from the technology side, you know, I guess standing on the outside before I started the startup, I thought technology was simple um, and easy and it is neither of those things. Um, it is, uh, but it's amazing. I mean, the, it gives you the capacity to do things and the ability to do things that, you know, were not possible even just, you know, days beforehand. So there's something quite magical, I think, about the ability to use technology to solve really complex problems, which is what the three of us and many startups are doing. Um, so I think there's lots of learnings in that space. The one learning that we're uh, struggling is probably the wrong word, but actually right word, I'd say, um, is where we're now trying to get into the market because we're People aren't on the internet searching for bots to help with mental health. It's just not there. So as it is for any of the products that we're talking about tonight, it's not something that someone would go and search for. So what we're trying to figure out is the sales and marketing component because right now it sits with yours truly um, along with everything else. So the uh, how do we sell? How do we find the right customers? How do we market ourselves and get the right message out there? We're constantly sort of trying and changing things. So that's probably the one thing I I feel like I'm learning slowly at and we had one marketing company and now we're moving to another one and it just feels like that's taking quite a bit of time to land um, and so I spend quite a bit of time beating myself up that I should know this and I why don't I know this and then I realize actually I can't know everything if I know you know that then I can get someone to help me over here so I've just found some great people to come in and, and give me some advice and help me work through things but I have to mentally keep reminding myself that I can't know everything because otherwise I'll just default into beating myself up that I don't know everything so I think if you're going into this startup journey like we have it's probably just you know worth keeping it remembering that you are good at what you're good at and you'll do that really really well and for other things find help and don't beat yourself up about the fact that you can't do everything because you were only human i think that's really good advice and i think we'll go ahead and ask the other two founders like what what's some advice that you could give to like your younger self or like your early founder self oh i would say i don't know if you're asking me hillary but i'll just keep talking um i would say um we'll stop waiting for everyone else to like you so much and like yourself a bit more that would be the first thing i would say to my younger self um and stop worrying that you're not going to get it right so you've just got to start doing something and once you start you get a bit of momentum and you learn from that and then you'll keep going or you'll go in a slightly different direction but you spend so much time thinking about it and worrying about it and worrying what people will say i didn't tell my friends i was doing this for a while because i thought oh my god they're going to think i'm such a loser that i've you know quit my really good corporate job and now i'm running this company that makes me no money so you know that was what i in the beginning how i felt and then i had to just put it all aside and say you know what i'm i'm all in so i think that's what i would say to my younger self a couple of years ago and indeed 20 years ago as well yeah so just go for it right go for it stop worrying so much about it i really appreciate that danielle can definitely resonate so much with that um story um I mean, there's, there's lots of advice I would give to my former self. I often wish I could be 20 years younger with the perspective that I have now. I guess that's what age does to you. So you just think that all the time. But there was a point that I realized that most people were bullshitting most of the time, which was kind of a revelation to me that I used to actually think that people when they were talking knew what they were talking about genuinely. And as I've got older, I've realized that they're just making it up most of the time. And even if they're not, they're backing themselves, which is great. And so that actually was very liberating because it made me realize that I could too. <laughs> um, not necessarily just make it up, but like 
back myself. And that sounds like an extremely obvious thing to say, but I think it's very easy to, um, yeah, feel like you don't have what it takes. But anyone who's ever made it was just a really ordinary person who believed in themselves. And so that's sort of given me a lot of confidence to um, trust my intuition is right. And yes, to Danielle's point, and you can't do everything. Um, there's lots of other and higher great people <laughs> to fill in the gaps. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah, agree with what both of you have said um, that, yeah, just just keep going, just back yourself. And, and, and I would add that, especially when we're talking about capital raising, um, don't, don't be afraid to just go and ask. I, I, I found it at the beginning and I, I don't know if it was my, my background was in finance and I was very much like, oh, it's just a little start. I was really too risky for anyone to put any money in. But by the way, would you like to? And I had to change all of that and just be really bullshy and just say, look, it's awesome. Do you, you know, I've got lots and lots of other investors who wants to come on, come on board. So it, it's sometimes it's about just getting out of your own way and just just getting out there and and being brave. That's a really good point. I think sometimes the worst you're going to hear is no, and that's okay. You just have to keep going. Um, so in terms of like support networks, like I know when you fail or when you hear no a lot, like it's hard to come back from that sometimes. Do you have a mentor or support network that you go to for advice and encouragement? Uh, I've, I've got my co-founders now. I was uh, originally, I've, I know we've had a question on the chat. I was originally a solo founder and very, uh, very soon after I finished, she starts and um, we had done our first uh, seed round, a million dollar seed round. I was able to actually employ staff and the first two hires I made were two co-founders and that's been invaluable um, for letting off steam, basically. So that's, that's been, yeah, that, that's who I, I rely on. Yeah, I also, and I, I've seen that in the chat too. Um, I do have a co-founder and, and these guys will know Jessica and we sort of share 80% of a brain because we're sort of very similar people from a similar background. So that's actually very helpful in lots of ways, challenging in other ways, but um, having uh, others in the business and now having also a CTO and a, a leadership team who we can sort of internally debrief with and be really honest with is helpful. But outside of that, definitely have other support networks um, uh, through the CEO network, another amazing um, uh, female founder network, which I highly recommend. Um, we've had other sort of mentors and coaches um, through that. Um, other founders who we've met through She Starts and others are an incredible kind of inspiration uh, for us. And then I have to remember, as in like, I literally have it on my wall and I color code myself each week, red, red, red or, uh, orange or green as to whether I did it, meet with friends because it's easy to forget that you have other friends outside your work and family, but actually meeting with friends who are able to um, kind of encourage and support just on a very daily basis. They know nothing about my business really, but um, a very reassuring um, is also just a very grounding um, practice as well, but I have to remind myself to do it. <laughs> Yeah, it's very easy to get that tunnel vision. I find the same, Lucinda. Um, I, I agree with what um, everyone has said, definitely. Um, I have some great people. We have a, an advisory board. So there's a couple of a customer advisory boards. So there's a couple of great people on that that are, are great to let off steam to, but also ask questions. Sometimes you just need to ask a kind of tricky question. So they're great. So definitely if you can find a couple of mentors or advisors help you. Um, and I'm very lucky. My partner is ex-startup. So he did the opposite. He went from startups into corporate. I went from corporate into startups. So he kind of understands what's going on and he's quite involved in, you know, listens to everything and um, gives advice and, you know, sometimes works in the startup. So he ran, our, he, runs, he runs our testing kind of suite and stuff like that. So that's been really, really great because I often think I'm going a little bit crazy. Um, and because my family is, is not from the technology world, it's, you know, it's hard to explain some of the stuff that we're experiencing and going through. So it's great to have just a, a sort of independent sort of third party to, to voice some of those concerns and fears to and get some um, advice. So definitely have some support people around. I think it's pretty important. Yeah, I saw like in the chat also from Alana, um, what motivates you to keep going when you, when you ask yourself, is it all worth it? Uh, I don't want to let my team down actually. 
So um, I uh, sometimes ask myself, is it all worth it? And then I remember my kind of burnout experience and what that did to my kids who were very little at the time and I'm a single mum. And then I think about my team and the commitment I've made to my team and the customers. And so I just have to kind of pick myself up and keep going. Um, but as I said before, too, I try not to beat myself up too much. I let myself have a moment of going, OK, it's tough for a minute. I'll give you five minutes to have a bit of moan and groan and then, you know, get back to it. So um, that's what I have found is useful and sometimes just switching off. So as Lucinda said, I've got to force myself to get out and see people and, you know, catch up with friends and go to the go and work out or do some exercise or something a bit different so that helps me if I can get out of my head for a little while it tends to help me get back back on track yeah I, I agree getting out of your head is sometimes the best <laughs> the best way to deal with it yeah. um and I will add for, for us at Bindi Maps it's always about our users so our people with disabilities so the you yeah, know our blind and vision impaired clients our people in wheelchairs and people on autism spectrum, as well as all of the, you know, we call them the entitled able-bodied people. Um, but that that also is a very strong motivator to keep us going. But you still need to take that time out um, to, you know, go and, and hound something at the gym. So when you've had a particularly aggravating meeting. Yeah, I, I really resonate with what you're both um, saying there. And I mean, I think at a kind of principle level, I'm broadly speaking motivated by what the world looks like when we succeed and that we've got the capacity to actually change the way that we create cities. And imagine if we designed them around people instead of around traffic and the different kinds of well-being opportunities that would exist and so that's kind of like a lifelong problem that I'm interested in solving in lots of different ways including with technology but day to day it's not necessarily that what comes to mind <laughs> when I get out of bed and you're like you've got a deadline or you've got to submit a tender or deal with a staffing issue or something like that so I think um yeah probably to Danielle's point I, I do feel committed to our team um I do feel committed to our customers um and and the next step um but i do try and moderate like everything that's going on with you know running and other things that kind of just sort of have avenues other than humans to sort of <laughs> manage the stress sometimes <laughs> i think that's all really good advice um i see that tracy also asked in the chat she um has a startup called up the echo in vietnam they're making co coconut eco-friendly products and she wants to know what clubs or groups can they join or connect with in Australia and also do you think eco-friendly business is a good idea in Australia? I mean I think eco-friendly business is a very good idea um, and I don't know much about um, health foods or other industries but I lived in the Pacific for a number of years where you know coconut oil and coconut products are a major export particularly in Samoa and there's a couple of um, startup networks who are looking to bring those products to Australia who might be worth connecting with and happy to chat offline about those companies. And so Renee wants to know if any of you had an MVP or proof of concept before she starts or is a gut instinct that it's a good idea enough? Just a, re a really crazy idea, sorry. <clears throat> Nothing else. <laughs> yeah, I laugh about that often. Because I think it's like how we had a six slide PowerPoint deck, which was completely hypothetical <laughs> and had no idea if it was even possible. We're like, imagine if we could tap into all of this other interaction data from Google and Facebook and places and measure how cities work. And I still can't actually believe that that was enough to get us over the line. But um, it turns out it is possible. And that was actually a really great idea. Um, but we had a very, we were extremely early. Like I can't even believe how early we were. Um, so I think that's just all again about like, never think it's too early or not validated enough. Um, because I think there's, you've got to start somewhere. And the idea is always the starting point. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't even have a PowerPoint deck. I just wanted to build like, um, Microsoft had built a spell checker. I just wanted to build a spell checker for stress. So that was kind of the extent of the idea and, um, you know, which is crazy for a non-technology person to say. I think what I did have though, uh, at which everyone's had on the call here, is that we had really deep domain expertise. 
So whilst we didn't have a technology product, we knew the area that we wanted to work in. We understood the problem. We thought we had a way that the solution might work to the problem because the solution will continue to shift as the customers and the market shifts. So um, I did have that. And I think what we all had was a huge amount of passion. So I was adamant that I was not going to let people burn out the way that I did. I was adamant that we could have better organisations where we could, you know, we could thrive and we could bring our whole selves to work. So I just was, you know, um, committed to seeing that through. And um, then then the rest came afterwards. Well, that's um, really, really good feedback. And I, I just want to acknowledge um, Paula said in the chat that she's had a bit of a crushing disappointment today. So feeling better just listening to your stories of failure and support. So it's just good to know she's not alone. So I think that's a really nice thing to acknowledge too. Um, Rikita wants to know, before you started your startup, did you fear that you would fail and how did you overcome that fear? I, I treated mine as one step at a time. So, um, and I think that was one of the benefits of doing this through the incubator program, because the way that it was set up was first, you did your application, uh, then you did your, you know, your week, and then you had to do your pitch, and then you had to be selected, and then you had to do this. So I just did it in stepping stones. Um, I think otherwise, if you just, you know, you try to imagine world domination and then you don't, <laughs> you don't you're not going to get there that quickly, uh, it could be really heartbreaking. So I'd say just, you know, it's like, you know, how do you eat an elephant? It's, you know, one bite at a time. So that, that would be my advice. Yeah. Absolutely, totally. I mean, I feel like I'm going to fail all the time. So that's not a new feeling. I think the um, a bit like Anna, I break it down into manageable steps. But I, I remind myself often that the guys that started Airbnb slept on a couch and sold cereal until they, someone had fund them because no one had fund them. And if you look at all of the really great kind of amazing ideas that have actually changed the world, no one had fund them in the beginning. So I remind myself of that quite often and think, well, you know, these guys gave it a go. Um, and the worst that can happen is that you've learned a whole lot of stuff and you'll take that into whatever you do in the future. So if you see it less as the company succeeds or the company fails and more as an opportunity just to learn and do a lot of really, really interesting things, then it's never going to be a failure. Um, so that's the way that I keep myself moving forward. Yeah, I think one of the challenges is I think I can... Um... You know, when you're a founder, you have to put yourself out there a lot. But the challenge of that is it means that your kind of personal identity and brand gets quite tied to your business. And so I think one of the things that can be challenging is I almost feel like comfortable with my business failing, but I'm not sure how my ego would go if the business failed. And I think I just try and keep that in check by asking myself that question. Like, what would I do? Because every day you're walking the knife edge of this might be incredibly huge or we might fail next year. And it could go either way, to be honest, you roll a dice. And I wouldn't have it any other way because I actually personally really enjoy being in that kind of dynamic um, environment. But I do have to sort of think about like, what is it that I'm basing my identity on uh, and try and separate it a little bit <laughs> from um, the business. Yeah, I saw on Twitter the other day, someone said like, you are not your startup. And I think that's a really important thing to acknowledge. Like you are separate from that. If it fails, it's okay. And like, I've actually seen a lot of people use a failed startup as like a really um, big step in their resume. So they've said like, you know, it's pretty much like a mini MBA. You run your own business, you do the marketing, you do everything. So, you know, it's not necessarily a failure. Um, so Tours wants to know how many startup ideas did you have before you landed on this one? I've still got hundreds. <laughs> We're not stopping with this one. <laughs> But this one was the closest to my heart, so that's how I landed on it. Yeah, I'm like Anna. I have new ideas all the time. <laughs> um, I'm not allowed to have any new projects at the moment. That's the family rule. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, trying to stay focused. But I do, I do, I'm genuinely passionate. The, the problem of, you know, trying to solve neighbourhood 
inequality, trying to improve neighbourhood wellbeing is actually the, pro the problem I've been trying to solve in different ways for 15 years, either as a consultant or working for the United Nations or running a consultancy or now a startup. So I feel like quite committed to that as a problem that I'm working on. But in terms of other business ideas, I have heaps. Pet rental was when I was coming up today because I like, I really don't like my guinea pigs anymore and I want to give them back. So I was thinking, imagine if we could rent them. Anyway, that's not something, if anyone wants to do that, I would totally be your customer. <laughs> I would be the same. I have a blue tongue lizard here that my daughter's decided she doesn't want anymore. So um, I, uh, I have uh, lots of problems that I'd like to solve, um, but this is kind of the first startup. As I said, I didn't even know what a startup was. So um, I, I feel like for me, it's about solving a problem. And if a business can solve a problem, a bit like what Lucinda was saying, then I will go for it. I'm kind of like a business person. I like to use business as a way of solving the problem. Um, so there's probably some, you know, many ideas. But, the, you know, the one thing I'd really love is that whole funding thing. We talked about that before. Like funding is just so unpleasant for everybody. I think for the people that are, are receiving the funding, so the startup sort of businesses, as well as the investors, you know, I've heard from investors, multiple different types that they don't enjoy it either. Um, probably the only people that are enjoy it are the, the people that are making money from it. So I don't know, the finance people or the lawyers, I don't even know who makes money from this process, but whoever does are probably the ones that are enjoying it. So maybe that's an idea for the future. Um, but I, I will stick with one big problem at a time. Okay, well, I'll just ask you guys one last question. Um, do you have any tips for people in the audience who are considering starting their own startup? I would do it. it. Yeah, just, just do it. I was going to say borrow Nike's phrase and just do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I think if you're if you're if you're passionate enough about the problem, because um, I think that's really important. You've got to be really committed to wanting to solve the problem if you're just coming in the startup to for it to be cool or to make some money um you know the, the motivation might not get you far enough so i think if you're really passionate about a problem that you're wanting to solve then i think just just get into it there's lots of accelerators and incubators and support out there now which is really cool um i think paula i'm sorry you've had a tough day hang in there tomorrow is always another day um but just yeah just get in there and get started yeah, I often think of the metaphor that you, you can't steer a parked car. And so it's impossible to know whether you'll like it or not, what you're going to need to learn, even how big the challenge is until you start. And then just looking at what, what's the next sort of step. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I started with customer research. So I didn't even start by looking at an accelerator or a technology or anything. I just started asking people, would you like this? Would you buy this? How would you use it? And so that that costs nothing. It doesn't, you don't need to be an expert just to ask the people around you or the people that you work with or the people you see at the shops some questions and just start to see how people feel about whatever it is that you're trying to solve. Um, you could start that right now. You could get off this and ring someone and have a chat with them. So that's a really easy way, I think, to, to get some momentum and to get that parked car moving. Yeah, I agree. That's a really good way to, to get going and sort of validate your early idea. And so I'm going to pass back to Chloe because we're wrapping up now. But thank you so much, everyone, for your awesome feedback and answers to our questions. And um, I think it was a really interesting night. So just a little bit about GA. We're a global tech education company helping people upskill in technology, business, data, and design. And our mission is to empower people to pursue work they love. You can visit us online at ga.co to check out all of our offerings from classes and workshops and free events like this one.